Well, we're going to get started on this reading. Uh, have a few announcements. Um, so there's a couple of events happening over the next couple of months. Um, in June, there's the virtual event, similar to one that was earlier this month. Um, did that get louder? A little bit. Mm -hmm. Um, and then in July, the International Speed Month, uh, user con. Um, so if anybody's interested in doing a carpool, that's what that track off on the uh, finding sheet for. Um, breakfast starts at 7 a.m. They're open at the area with the 8 and then the keynote is at 9 a.m. Um, if you are planning to go to that, you're going to want to um, sign up soon. There is an option to do NSX training. Um, there, it's like a 10, 20 to 4 o'clock training. Um, there's more information about it on the website. But there's, uh, it's a pretty in-depth training on it. So, so. But I, there is a limited number of people that can have that, so make sure you sign up for it. Um, and then our next meeting is June 20th. Um, that'll be our normal quarterly meeting. Uh, we don't currently have a sponsor yet. I hope that next couple days we'll have that item now. Um, the presenters um, will be Adam Eckerly, who will be coming to speak on Wall Street on 6 7, at least for 6 7. And then Edward Kalaki, I think that is it. He will be presenting remotely, but um, he'll be presenting on security and science. So some ways to monitor your uh, user infrastructure. Um, and how to adjust it over time. Yeah, um, the probably have a small presentation from whoever sponsors. So um, there's June, um, I didn't write it down, but I already had the slides done when I found on this out. Um, July or June 13th, I believe. Um, VM, or VMUG headquarters will be sending out a, um, a user survey or a member survey. Um, asking some questions, so I urge you to go ahead and take a few minutes and fill that out so that it helps them um, on the direction that the user group goes. So. Um, then, of course, I've got to have some slides on the community challenge and stuff. So I know some of you guys are new, haven't been here. Um, we do have a community challenge going on right now. Um, it's There's 20 VMUGs that are in the challenge. Um, It'll end at the end of June. The top 10 groups get $3,000 towards um, a meeting um, for one of these types of um, items. There's another one missing off. Oh, no, it's the, you can either have a VMware expert come, um, which it means probably a flight and hotel and things we can't, normally can't afford. Um, we can do a lab or, uh, I don't know the difference between a social lab and a hands-on lab. But anyways, um, we're in, Fourth place right now. Yes. Oh, no, it is third. It is third. We're in third. Um, yeah. Um, so, that's a great question. Great, great question. Here we go. Okay. <laughs> Here's how it's scored. Um, every meeting we have, we get five points. Um, posts online to our community site, that's where we get our most points. If you go onto our community page, um, and either reply to a discussion or start a discussion, we get five points for each post you do. Um, so it can be just a basic post. Um, it doesn't have to be long and in-depth and everything else. They just, they just pull a report. So um, the top group, that's how they've gotten all their points is through the, the discussion. Um, they have 800 and some odd points. We have 300 and some. And we're in third, so I mean, and we're not that far out of second. So um, second, third, fourth are right, real close to each other within like 30 points. So it's not not a big difference. But as long as we stay in the top 10, we're, we'll get the, you know, we'll win. But yeah, you still have some bragging rights if you get into the top. There you go, <laughs> yeah. Um, so, um, and then overall community or community growth um, and points are based on percentage. Our group isn't growing a lot. Um, and one of the main reasons, it's a small group. Um, and 
I've been going through the um, roster and actually removing people because there's people from India and Asia and you know, whatever in the group. So as I go down through them, as I find those, I send the list to headquarters and say, you know, take those off there because they, they're not part of our local group. And I want to try to keep it local. Um, so, um, so anyway, so our group's probably going to have a decrease in size. So I don't, hope, I don't think they'll take points off <laughs> for that. But uh, yeah, um, then we get social media points or for posting on, on Slack or uh, Twitter and, and Facebook and stuff. But that's only two points. So that's not a big deal. Um, that's two points a month, not every post. So um, they do have a couple things where we can get bonus points for doing sp specific posts, but they really haven't ever gotten detailed on what that post needs to be. So, but again, it's still not a big deal. This still is the main thing is the the community post. All right, and then um, kind of to piggyback off of that. Um, we have, we do get two VMUG advantages every year to give away. Um, and so this year, rather than just doing a flat out drawing, um, we're having not exactly a contest, but you can increase your odds of winning that drawing. Um, we'll be giving one away in June, uh, which is next month's meeting, and then another one in December. Each meeting that you attend, you get a, an entry into the drawing. Each post you put on our discussion page, you get a um, entry into the drawing. Um, I, have, I did not pull an updated one from last month, but um, there are several that have 10 to 12 um, or more uh, option, or, uh, chances in the drawing already. So um, one thing we will do is the entries will carry over. So anything that's been earned up through June when we do our drawing will still continue and build up to the December drawing. So if you have 12 of them in June, in December, you're going to have that plus whatever you get between June and December. So, um, now I know we have some new guys. Does everybody know what VMUG Advantage is? I know this, some of the um, guys that have been here before have because we go over it pretty much every time. But uh, nope, good. Well, we'll go over the next couple slides then. <laughs> <laughs> um, there are a couple things or a couple things that it deals with. One is the um, hundred dollars off VMworld registration. Um, and I didn't put that on our announcement slides. Uh, registration has opened for VMworld as well. Um, so if you have VMUG Advantage, when you go in and, and you log in, it'll automatically take $100 off of your cost, um, whether you qualify for other discounts or not. So um, the cost of VMUG Advantage, if you go out and buy it, is 180, well, it's, sorry, it's $200, but there's always a 10% discount floating around that you can get it for 180. So, so at that point, if you are going to VMworld, you want to get this, and then you get it for 80, you know, like 80 or a hundred bucks. Um, and what that also gives you is, you know, you get some discounts off of, um, of uh, courses and exams and, and that type of thing. Um, but then you have the, also the eval experience. That's, that's the big reason why I got it initially was for the eval experience and why most people do. Um, you get a one year subscription. Um, for licenses for, for most all VMware uh, um, products. And here's a list of all of them you get. Um, you will notice somewhere here that, uh, yeah, I don't know, where's vSphere on here? Anyways, vSphere, it's, it's right now it's still 6.5. They haven't got 6.7 uploaded, but it's supposed to be there within the next couple of days, so. Yeah, they've been, dis they've been discussing it on the community site, so. Um, but anyway, so that's, a, that's not for production licensing, that's evaluation licensing to have in your lab or, or whatever. Um, the big one I use, um, which I discussed last time, was the Workstation Pro. Um, it's, it's nice for a couple of different things, but one is you can copy and paste into a console. That, to me, that's huge. <laughs> um, it's nice. And I know you can make some modifications to the... Um, you know, regular client or whatever to be able to paste into them, but that's a pain to have to do that for every single VM. So that, that gives you some options. But you can't cut and paste everything, it's text. Um, so basically it types it out for you. So that's still nice. Um, but it does also allow you to run VMs locally on your machine um, that are able to also be run in your 
production environment. So, um, you know, they're formatted properly, not having to convert them from Hyper-V or, or whatever you want to run them on. So, so that's a big deal. So that's, we'll be giving one of those away next month. Um, and then uh, you don't have to be present to win since we're doing the contest. Um, I would like you to be present to win, but you don't have to be. Um, so does anybody have any questions about Steam Mug Advantage? Um, that's all I got. How'd I do on time? Yeah, early. I gave myself half hour, so you know it took me like yeah ten minutes. So, all right, I am going to turn it over to Ryan and Tim um, to start our presentation tonight on PowerShell. We're going to start at the base level um, and work our way up. Um, and through, if anybody didn't get a handout, make sure to let us know and we'll get you one of the handouts. Um, Tim put that together, um, it's a lot of information. Um, and definitely come in handy. The, the Power CLI, we'll get to that probably at a, uh, the next meeting, um, not, not June. June, we're not doing Power Shell and Power CLI, but we'll pick it back up in July, August. And then in September, so I said I was done, but I'm not. Um, in September, um, we'll have Kyle Ruddy, which is one of the, um, uh, what's his title? Uh, sales engineer or whatever for Power CLI or whatever. But basically, he's one of the direct access at VMware to talk to the programmers that deal with Power CLI, and he's, he's a big expert on it. Um, there's a um, uh, Slack channel for VMware code. So if you, um, you know, do use Power CLI, it's a good, um, good channel to get on, or workspace to get into. Um, they have lots of different channels within that workspace, depending on what, how you use Power CLI. Um, they can go in and ask questions or even provide answers to other people asking questions. It's a pretty active um, workspace. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of people in VMware directly that are on it. So you usually get directly from the programmers if you have a question about how to how to do things. So um, I've used it a few times and you know, it comes in handy. So there's also a PowerShell Slack channel as well. Um, then they have a Power CLI channel under theirs, but um, it's not quite as active as the, the VMware Code one is. So um, if you have not joined VMware Code and you want to, just go to VMware or uh, it's code.vmware.com. Um, and uh, there's a place you can register for that. And I, there's a link inside there to get access to the Slack channel. So does everybody know what Slack is? I guess I'm making an assumption. I know we've talked about it, but um, so you're not quite sure. Let me just show you real quick. Can you let me share my screen out for a second again? It's sometimes easier to show than, than to. Um, okay. Um, um, you can see I actually have a, a lot of different Slack channels that I'm in, but, or workspaces, excuse me, sorry. Each one's called a workspace, and then within that you have channels. So you can see here, these are our different channels um, that we have. Um, you can see we have some leader ones um, that you guys won't see those, but uh, that's where, as leadership, we discuss different things. But then you have the open ones, the ones without the locks. Um, so if we have information about the meetings, we'll post in there, whatever. But um, if you look at, ignore the Citrix ones, this is a VMUG event. <laughs> um, so, um, no, nope, I didn't want that one. Uh, VMware code, that's one we want, sorry. Um, so basically it's, it's similar to an instant messenger, but it allows us to, to categorize things into different, cat or into different channels um, or um, subject matters. Um, so like in the VMware or the code, there's um, AWS, there's just a general tab, which is just for general questions or whatever. Um, home lab there, you know, we're going to have an Indy hackathon down in Indy that we're going to help with, but it's kind of got delayed because of, um, because of this, this VMware lab build, we're building that out in AWS and making it where as a group, um, a local VMA group, we can just basically click a button and it builds the environment for us that we can use to, to do the hackathon. Rather than have to have physical equipment here on site, it's much cheaper to do it in the cloud. 
assuming we don't leave it running for weeks. And yeah, so, um, so yeah, but you'll see also there's this channels button. If we click on that, there's, yeah. Yeah, I should just look down here. It's the same thing, right? Um, but you can see there's, there's lots of different channels inside of that Slack. Most, most of the Slack workspaces you get into aren't gonna have this many, but um, yeah. Just so you know you're not sharing your screen, so I'll see you. I'm not sharing my screen, that's right. Oh well, it won't be on the recording, but you'll hear it. Um, hopefully whoever's watching it can see, or can, and knows what that is, but. But anyways, um, all your information is separated between these workspaces. So when you sign up for one, it's totally separate from any other one you've signed up for. So passwords are different, emails could be different, um, you know, or whatever. If you change your profile in one, it does not change it in every one. Um, I wish there was an option to tell it to replicate, but there's not. So, so anyways, so that's what that's what Slack is. It's a um, you can also direct message. You can see I've been messaging Ken Nelbone down in Indy. About the V mug down there, um, so yeah. Um, you can say direct message Tim there, but if you go into our meetings, um, you see our Twitter feeds on there as well. So if we have a um, tweet, it'll get automatically put into that channel. So if you want to see all those and you're not on Twitter, you can go there and see them. So if you are on Twitter, you can follow us and get them that way. So all right now you can take it back over. Um, um, so yeah, so we are on Slack, we're on Twitter, we're on Facebook, uh, we're on LinkedIn. Um, so we uh, basically put the same information on all of them. So you know, if you're on one, you, you're going to get the information. So I don't know how you guys are going to share the mic. If you go back and forth. Start off, and I'm mad about. We'll go with that. Hi, uh, those that haven't met me, I'm a leader here. Uh, my name is Ryan Wall. I'm the network engineer at Huntington County Community School Corporation. Um, I'm going to start off if he gets rid of his Slack channel. There you go. Uh, I'm just going to start off with a baseline PowerShell because PowerShell, we're going to get when Kyle gets here, we're going to be at PowerShell I, but we want to kind of get everybody the same. Uh, and to start off with, how many of you guys have used PowerShell to begin with? Hands up. Just, just and, that, and, that, and this is what, so I've got a va wide variety and I, I have to show off this because uh, if you're looking at his screen, the center square is why we all want to learn PowerShell. We want to be the, we want to be the automator, not the automated. <laughs> and that's a very good thing. Uh, just a little bit of history of how I got started with PowerShell. When I took over at, as the network engineer uh, at School Corporation five years ago, um, I came into uh, the summer. And for those that have ever worked with school corporations, you think school is the slow time? You're completely wrong. That's when we're hitting the floor running and we never stop. Um, so I, had, I came in, in the midst of, we're putting in a new wireless, and oh, by the way, two days before school started, someone came to me and said, uh, you're gonna run that script to uh, get all the new users' accounts in Active Directory, right? Sure, I'll, I'll get that when I get all the wireless working in all the buildings. I started that script, and it was a very base script. I started working on that script at eight o'clock, the night before school started, that script finished putting 5,000 user accounts into my Active Directory at three, three o'clock in the morning. I went home, went to sleep, got up at 7 a.m. was back at work. But if I had to do that by hand, I would have been nuts. And if I would have tried to do anything else with some of the other tools that I was trying to figure out really quickly, it wouldn't have happened. I'm not saying that that first script was good. It was horrible, but it got me user accounts that could get me through the school starting. That original script was, I think, 80 lines of code. Now my opening school script is 450 lines of PowerShell code uh, to get everything going. And then I don't run that script every day now. I run a modified script that I've taken stuff out of that to do stuff. And I have a script that I run daily to check if there's anyone new in my PowerShell environment, Active Directory environment, give them the Office 365 licensing that I need to give to them and make sure their user, their 
their email password is all email and everything like that. And I also have one that I do for my staff because staff has on-prem exchange, students have Office 365. I've got PowerShell scripts to make my life easier and it's really just, I just have three scripts that I run every day and I really, as soon as I get more comfortable with it, just gonna throw them in a test, task scheduler and just have them run in the background and not even worry about it anymore. Basically the only reason I haven't done it is because I've been too lazy to do it. <laughs> Other things going on. So we're gonna start off small. Um, so since we have a la vast majority, I wanna kinda just talk about PowerShell and PowerShell grammar. I think of PowerShell as a language. It's a language that hopefully most of us know, but we just have to learn the English uh, syntax of it. I stunk in English, but if you learn a couple of rules and these rules don't usually change, you'll, you'll be good. Most of the way you're doing stuff is you're gonna have a, noun, a verb noun context. And so uh, just to kind of start off with that, most of the verbs are uh, not all of, all of the verbs, but a lot of the verbs you're gonna use, you're gonna use new to create something that's new. You're gonna remove because you're gonna move it. These are, I won't say they're set in stone, but they're very, that's, that's the prescribed language that, yeah, that's, that's what everyone uses. When you write your own commandlets, do you have to follow that? Because you can write your own. Do you have to follow that? No, you don't. But it's gonna make other people, when they come to use your code, that big of a pain. Um, but you can do that. Um, what you're seeing now, especially with some of the other people is the way that most people are making um, commandlets their own is they're using that verb uh, functionality to be the same for new and stuff like that. But the way they're making them their own is they're putting in on the noun portion of it as an example, what I've started doing it uh, in my environment, it's still gonna be, instead of new user, I'm new HCCSC, which is our school acronym, new HCCSC user or new HCCSC student. That way we know that's ours, it's got all the sub context with that and then it doesn't, the, the names don't uh, clash with anything else that you're gonna do. So that, that helps. Um, some of the, again, some of the big PowerShell verbs, new, um, get, set, remove, when you start getting this concept in your head, and again, the way I always found working with PowerShell and the way I always tell everyone you're gonna do it, you gotta have a project, even if it's a simple project. Say you wanna create a new user. Active Directory, everyone usually has in their environment. If you don't have Active Directory, stand up a little environment. Get something that you have to do stuff every day and just find reasons to do it. Will it take you longer the first time when you start to do something? Yes, it's gonna take you a long time to do some of that stuff. But once you figure out how to do that, you, can, you build upon those skills and everything else. Now when someone comes and asks me an Active Directory question, I'm opening up PowerShell and plowing through that really quickly because now I have, I, one, I understand the schema of Active Directory a heck of a lot more than I ever have in the past. And two, I'm just comfortable in Active Directory and I'm forcing myself to do that. And the way I build something, and we'll kind of go over a build example here in a minute, a very basic build example that we can do, um, is I start small getting what I need and then I figure out ways to, to expand it and make it go on. Um, and Tim and I were just talking, and, and Tim's gonna talk in a little bit, is some of the commands that I use a lot, get command. I know that if I need to create something new or I want to do something, the verb is going to be new and then I usually think, or right, is it going to be new and whatever object I'm going to create. So I use git command to help try to find those and, and sort down and there's ways to do that. I use git help all the time. Yes, you could go out and Google how to do something a lot bit faster, but what you're going to find now that, Google, now that PowerShell has been out there a long time, you may find someone that had something with PowerShell 1 that has been completely changed by the time we're now at five. PowerShell 5 and, and even with some of the core stuff. So start with help documentation because the help documentation on your system is a lot easier. I'm gonna walk through updating the help documentation on your screen uh, computers because when you, when you get a fresh version of Windows 7 or, or Windows 10, that help documentation is not current. So there's a way to automatically update that information and get going. I use Git member a lot as well because especially in Active Directory, um, you need, 80 user is, so like if I was gonna get a user out of um, Active Directory, get 80 user. But then you have all of the, the, the properties associated with that. And how do you know what all those properties are and what they're named? Get member helps you do that and we'll kind of walk through that. It is unstable. Okay, well, we'll hope not. Select object is, is exactly what it does. It's kind of like a select statement in SQL. 
you're going to select certain things out of there to pull out and be able to look at. And where object is a great filter. It allows you to say, all right, if it takes that large, get all 80 users that have that thing and kind of focus it down to what you want to do. Um, those are the key concepts and we're going to kind of use those in a little demo that I have created. Um, the story I was coming up to think about is, you know, you have, this is a prime example, IIS logs, how many have IIS servers on their, on their, yeah. How often do the log files fill up your drive and if you don't pay attention, they can do that. So this is a, this is a type of an example that you could set up and do with your IIS logs. I just created something stupid that would work. So we're gonna do this and see how well the internet holds up. All right, nothing like demoing, come on. Uh, I keep dropping it there and then I forget about it. All right, I'm gonna stop my screen and see if that is why I can't share. Live demos, always fun. Okay, here we go. If it doesn't work this way, we'll do it another way. Here we go. Usually when I do a demo, I also clear that off, but I forgot to do that today. All right, back to, oops. Back to sharing screen. Share screen. All right. Start that really quick. Okay. So in this example, I have basically, how many of you, have, some of you said you've messed with PowerShell. Let's actually have some fun here first. Um, one of the things that I, well, let me do my demo and then we'll, we'll get into some other stuff. So in the case of the ISX logs, I have a folder. It's, there's no script. Here. We're having fun. In this folder is basically what you would normally see on IS logs. I've just got files that are zero base files, but as an example, files in here. So use whatever example you want, but basically you have this folder that can constantly has um, files in it. Now you could sit throughout your day, constantly check on that stupid folder and, and drag or delete those files as need be. So maybe it's temp files or something like that. Or you could use PowerShell to make your life easier. So the first command I'm running is the simple dir command. That's an alias for another command and in, in thing, but it works the same as it was in your command prompts back in the old days. So what I'm gonna do is take that DR command and, and just have some fun with it. One of the first things I do when we were talking about um, the select object command um, is we're gonna talk about that. The first thing that I'm gonna talk about and the one of the things that I didn't go over in my slide presentations is the pipe command. Piping is like in the old Unix command when you start doing some of those things. You, piping is just taking the output of one command and shoving it into another command. So it, and the founder of um, PowerShell was Jeffrey Snover. He was a big Unix background. He liked the idea of piping that stuff. I think they did the PowerShell a lot better than Bash was because there are now objects that come across and you can do a lot more with that. Um, and it's been fun. It takes a little bit to get your head wrapped around it. So these are great little things that you have to start understanding and messing around with. But if I take the output of the, the directory command, you see on the, uh, up at top, you see I got the mode, uh, last write time, the length, which would be the size of the file and the name of the file. Maybe I needed to see that information a little bit differently. So what I can do is take the, no, not sleep. Um, and if you don't know how much fun it is to, yeah. Oh. Yeah. Do you know how much fun it is to, to also type life while you're um, trying to do this on a demo? It's more fun. So it's object. And I was at the end of that starting to tab. That's the other nice thing, uh, especially if you're learning first, I'm doing all of my work. I don't know if you can see it in the screen. I'm doing all my work to start with in PowerShell ISC. 
um, just because it gives me a little bit more tab completion and it gives me the ability to, to see some of the other stuff as I'm typing. When I want to write a script in here, um, as an example, if I were to start it up here, it does the tab completion and allows me to see the other objects when I'm doing there. That's why, especially if I'm starting off, I'll start in there. I don't want to see my script. I'll start up in ISC to be able to help me cut and paste things together. So when I'm writing a script to do something, I'll start down here in the, the window and get the commands that I need to, and then I'll copy those commands up into the script area after I get what after I get what I want and, and, and manipulate it a little bit that way. So um, the other nice thing that I was just learning and playing around with here, when I do a select object, it gives me the ability to, if I know what some of the parameters are, it, it, it'll pop them out and tab completion and all those as well. But how do I know what some of those parameters are? So um, when I was talking about get member, get, not media, get member, uh, when I run that on the DR command, it'll actually pull, pulls up every attribute and method that allows on, that comes out of the DR command. And let me get in here to kind of show you what I'm talking about. So it gives the, I can pull up attributes, created time, the directory it's in, the directory name, if it exists, the extension, the full name, is it read only? These are attributes that are on that. When you run just the DR command, it's only gonna give you out what the writer of that command decided to do that, but that doesn't mean you can, you don't have to take those, you can create your own, you can adjust that and go as well. So as an example, I can do DIR, if I can type now, select, I just wanna do the name, uh, last access time, and the extension for something, maybe, extension. Maybe I just need to see what those are. And I hit enter, and then it gives me all that information in the command. Maybe some reason there, my boss wants a report of all that information. You can start working your way down through that. Um, Active Directory gives you, start doing some Active Directory stuff, it allows you to do even more with that stuff. Um, DR command doesn't have as much. Okay, so we're gonna try to figure out how to deal with those, the wonderful folder. So as an example, I, uh, those files are in the demo folder. If I were doing it and I wanted to move them to another drive, say I, I've got these files that are being created on this drive and I want to move them to another drive, but I don't want to sit there and manually copy and paste them throughout the day. What I can do is use PowerShell and make it work. So if I were going to do this to begin with, well, let's do it. If you were going to move files from one area to another, give me an idea of what the command might be that you use. What? Copy. copy. Well, that would copy them and it's still in the directory. What I probably, what else might I want to do? Or move them. Yeah, so we could use the move, we're going to use move item. Move item. And another reason to do it in here is because you get these drop downs. I want to tell it where I'm going to move it to. As you start playing with that, you'll, you'll figure out that sometimes you need to put that information in there. I like to make it so I, my code is a lot of, very readable because I will forget. When I started that 80 lines of code five years ago, creating those folders, I only hit that, I only really review that code right before I start doing the next one. That's been a year since, usually it's a year in between when I really hit it and that. So I personally don't like to use aliases and I personally like to have everything really spelled out. So when I'm coming back, my code is as readable as I can. So if I'm not there or I have to give my code off to someone else, they can kind of read through their code. So that's a choice for me because I've, I've had to read other people's code and it makes my life easier. But it also just is, I'll sleep, even from one day of working on something to the next, I'll forget what I was working on. I really like to have everything spelled out. So if I'm gonna move something and I wanna remember what it is, I'm gonna put the destination in there. So in this example, I'm just going to say demo temp. That could be another folder, it could be anything like that. The other wonderful thing about PowerShell that I think is, is kind of interesting is we have the ability to do a what if. The what if is the command that saved me so many times it's not even funny. What if it says, what if I run this code, what's it gonna do? Especially when you're new into PowerShell and you're not sure exactly what's gonna happen, the what if command is awesome. So if I do this correctly, hopefully, let's see if my code works, it's basically gonna tell you what it's, what it's gonna do. It's gonna say, what if it's gonna perform the operation of removing the file from target, tells you what the file name is, and put, tell it where the destination's gonna be. 
That's great when you're learning PowerShell, not sure exactly what you're gonna do with the command. The help is great in here, but sometimes you may not completely understand the help. Throwing that what if command on a lot of that stuff just makes your life so much easier. So that's exactly what I wanna do. So I could very easily run this command and do that once, but I don't wanna do that once. I don't wanna to have to keep pausing through here. So this is where automation and getting that, the, his laptop just makes me laugh. So what we can do is put it in a where clause and where is gonna work as long as it's true. Or if you say where is true, this is just kind of fun. It's gonna run until you stop the command. And just so we can kind of see what's going on, there's also another variable like what if, that's the pass through that says, if it doesn't normally, because sometimes some of these commands are quiet, but if it, if it isn't quiet, it's telling it specifically Specifically to put output information to the screen. So in this example, I'm saying where true, which means basically do this until I manually stop you for some reason. That copy, com that move command. So it's going to get the contents of the file. It's going to move into the new folder destination, and it's going to output that information. Well, did it? Or did I mess it up? Uh, I think I did. Absolutely. See color brace? Yeah, isn't that, well, there's one there at the end. Oh, no. Oh, ours is, I think ours is just lagging, really lagging. Lagging? Okay. Uh, uh, not that that shouldn't mess it. Is pass through what I wanted to use, or is I'm thinking of something else? Yeah, pass through should work. No, pass through. Where true. The other nice thing about PowerShell is the history. If you want information on the history, oh, if you want information on the history. Oh, yeah, nice. Good catch. Wow, not where. Wow, while loop. I'm sorry. There you go. That's the white. I didn't do anything. Do a while loop. I'm sorry. Yeah, because I messed up. Good catch on my code. And we'll give you, we'll find something. I owe, I owe somebody something. Yeah. yeah. So when you use the right loop function, instead of where, instead of while, do the while loop. Oh, there you go. Nice mug. There you go. Good catch on the code. So I have, what I didn't show you to begin with is I started a script over here that's basically counting up another while loop. Basically just create a new item in that demo folder called mailbox and a counter. counter. So this is gonna create up until 250, and I didn't think I was gonna talk that long. So go back onto this one. Every, sec, every five seconds, it's gonna sleep and create that new file. This is gonna keep going. So this while loop will keep going until it's true or until I stop it. But what that does is you're basically just automated the moving of the files from one location to the other in a couple lines of code. So that's the power that you can get with PowerShell. Now, I was talking about help. I see you guys have your laptop. At least those that didn't. Austin, who's my tech, didn't bring his, but we'll, we'll, we'll get on to that. <laughs> One of the things when you first, first thing I do, ever do when I get on a computer and I'm going to do PowerShell on it and not share the state of it, the first thing I'm going to do is update help. And I'm going to use this other command because it's, uh, we, it was talked about verbose. Because the, you have what if. Uh, pass through and verbose. Those are the, some of the commands that I use a lot just to get going. Verbose basically says, tell me everything you're kind of doing in the background. We'll do this. Now, this is lagging, so I'm not sure you're going to see it, but we'll try to see how fast it goes through. Uh, let's see how well the internet works. Yeah, so that's basically going to go out and up, compare your help files that you have on your local machine and why that's running so slow, I'm not sure to what is on the update, the, the updated help information. And pull down any new information that you have from the Microsoft website that hosts that repository. It takes a while, uh, especially if you haven't done it in a while, but it also tells you the current version that you have in your machine and compared to what it's up on the, on the server. Um, I have always run, whenever I run it, the last thing it always fails on an XML information. I'm not sure why, but if you get the red, that's bad, but don't worry, you're just updating the help. Then that gives you the ability. So as an example, um, yeah, I don't know why, but it does. So don't worry about it. But updating your help is important. Um, the other 
part of get help that I like when we're doing something. Um, we were talking about um, get AD user. The other thing that I use is on, on help about is I love examples. I learn through examples and doing anything else. So throwing the examples uh, tab when you're doing help, and this one sh should be rather large, it gives you all the, the examples of how to do stuff. And I learned from the examples. I'll actually read the examples before I actually go read the help documentation a little bit more because I can tell usually nine times out of 10, I can figure out what they, what they need, I, what I need to do from the examples before I go back into the code. The only some weird minor switches that I have to really get crazy that I do in that. But 99% of the time, get help, whatever command I'm looking for and examples is going to do that. Um, but how do I know what command I do? I can use get help to figure that out, but I can also use get command. Um, get command will run through and output every single command that you have on your box at any given time. <coughs> um, and just for fun, you can always do this. I was, met, I was having fun with this as well. You can always measure measure how many command lists do you have on your machine right now. I have 3,409 on my uh, station, uh, on my uh, primary box at my office. I had over 11,000 commands because I have additional modules that I run in there. I have all sorts of modules in my profile and we'll get to profiles and some of that other stuff in another class. But if you walk out of here with anything, the commands that you want to learn and get really familiar with are get help, get command, and update help. Those commands will help get you going and get you started. Any questions, anything else I can do that? I'm gonna turn over to Tim because he has, he's got an environment that I really am envious of. He's got some stuff that we'll have him walk through here in a minute. But anything base help that we, you guys wanna start talking about? Was it helpful at least giving you, getting the, 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 the wheels turning in your head, trying to understand some stuff? Tim's documentation is great. I actually have referenced it already. Uh, in my personal work because I saw it earlier. So um, I'm going to turn it over to Tim. Uh, if I don't hear any questions, um, what would you guys kind of like to see in the next round? Where That's the next question. So I'm not going to have anything in June, but where do you guys want to go next? I have some ideas in my head. If I don't hear anything, I'll, we'll, we'll shoot with that. Um, also, you can hit me up on the Slack channel if you want to. Uh, and Tim and I are going to get our heads together here after this too and kind of figure out some stuff that we can do. The goal is to get everyone kind of comfortable with PowerShell and then take it up to get some ideas of what we can do with PowerShell and the automations inside of in the VMware environment, and then really have Kyle bring it all at home in September. So go ahead. I was just gonna say, like, I was noticing you're really focusing on um, a lot of the Windows-centric type command lists, because I know they also use the Unix aliases. Yeah. So do you ever use that? Uh, as a matter of fact, LS is my favorite command instead of DR, but I didn't want to mess everyone's head up when I started doing that. <laughs> I, to the point where now when I pull up command prompt, I hit LS even before I hit DIR. I'm just lazy on some of that <laughs> stuff. So yes, um, um, we'll just kind of go over that really quick. Um, Cause that, that was something that really made me start warming up more to PowerShell because I'm familiar with the Unix stuff. More. Yeah, so again, Jeffrey, Jeffrey Snover was the user that created PowerShell. He came from that Unix background. So a lot of the, the Unix commands have a PowerShell variant. And the easiest way to see what some of those are um, is to run the get alias command. And that will tell you all of the aliases that are in here. As a matter of fact, when I was running DIR, actually DIR is actually an alias for get, uh, get child item. It's not even the actual command. It's not actually the DIR command you run a command prompt. It's actually an alias. So it actually, that's why it doesn't completely act the same way as DIR and the other ways. <coughs> but, it, that's another way of just trying to learn, learn, learn PowerShell is to get in there and do other things. That's the other reason um, Posh Code and some of those other things are great. Twitter, I know Reddit has a great uh, PowerShell area. Reading other people's code and if they're nice enough to not use aliases and really put everything in there, you learn a lot. Yeah, when they create their own functions. I'm, I was a big proponent because it always irked me when I was reading other people's code that they, did, weren't, they weren't using aliases. So that's why I specifically started not to do aliases. <coughs> Excuse me. But that's what, I, that's what I do. But yeah, if there's an, uh, and the nice thing is, if the alias that you have in here, there isn't an alias for something you want to do, you can create new alias. You can use the new alias command and create a new alias for what you want it to do. So, or you can write a commandlet 
names your alias and have it do all the stuff in the background. So there's several different ways. And then like probably the next class, we'll talk about profiles and how some of that really customization, customization comes into that thing. So um, do we want to take a break or do we want to turn it over to Tim? What's your thoughts? Um, Tim. All right, we're going to Tim. <laughs> I'm going to hand it over to Tim. There's more pizza than they want <clears throat> and I gotta go grab water because my <laughs> 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 Oh, I blew up and rebooted, so I'm not in there anymore. Oh, you're not on Slack anymore. No, do you need me back in? Yeah, you could, so that way we can start there. So it gets recorded. Slack? No. It's like, oh. Well, there was that. That was the second. Like, the first deal was the fact that it was changing. Some of those structures are out of key. Okay. Okay. Yeah, but I slowly unmounted the drive. Mount on the other shirt. Let me do it. You have to go to the mic on your. I didn't want to have to copy the size star environment. That was something we'll talk about later. It's more of a nice It works great when you do it. Yeah, I see you. I think I'm going to go to the next one. Well, yeah, the profile is actually. Is everybody back? They're doing data. I don't know. And they've got servers up there too. Amazon. Anything that's classified is air gapped. It's not in the network at all, accessible, locked rooms, that kind of stuff. So, okay. <clears throat> I'm Tim Garay. Currently, at the moment, I'm working over at um, working over at Harris down the road. Uh, I've been working at a number of different places over the last ten years or so in a lot of different environments. And one of the biggest things that comes up when you get into an enterprise level environment is automation. Uh, one. Th thing that I have learned, one, my little personal pet peeve, if I have to do something more than three times, it needs to be automated, if it can be, uh, as much as possible. My motto that I've added as my tagline on my signature now is work smarter, not harder. And, and I'll kind of work off of Ryan here, but my last job, when I came into it, they were in the middle of a NAS migration. They were moving all of their Windows Server file servers over to NAS devices. And they were doing it site by site, multiple different locations. And they were probably about halfway through. And they were do I'm from Ohio, uh, so I'm one of those foreigners that he keeps kicking off. Um, but so this was over in Lima, and they went to do that on one weekend, and they failed the project in doing the migration on that weekend. And the reason why they failed is because part of migrating all of this data was migrating the user share folders. And they were going into Active Directory and Control C, Control V, every, every user account by hand using the GUI. And oh, well, we didn't realize that there were so many accounts that had to be modified to change the path to their shared directories. And so we ran out of time and 
and had to roll it back. And I'm, why are you doing this with the GUI? And well, why don't you just, this is, you know, your little one line or command and it'll do it in three minutes and you're done. And it goes beyond just Active Directory. If you get into things like the, the DFS, the distributed file system links and things like that, that can be automated too. Oh yeah, well, we were changing that too. No. So the next time we did it, they had allotted like eight to 10 hours for modifying the user accounts. We allotted five minutes. Script done, ready to go, just hit enter. Okay, I'm done, move on to the next line. Okay, that's, that's the example of what Microsoft was thinking when they came up with this idea of PowerShell. If you've got one server, you know what, does it really make a lot of sense? If you've got 10 users in your environment and one server, you know, it's just as easy to use the GUI. But if you, if you get into the world and you watch, you know, my kids got into the gaming, online gaming and things like that. And if you watch when they do the little demos and they have the cameras over the people, they're not using their mouse. They're sitting there with their hands on the keyboard. Why? Because the mouse slows you down. And when you can do the keyboard, you can repeat a lot of stuff and you can go a lot faster. So getting into the automation side of things, this is what was meant for PowerShell and getting into Windows environment is doing a lot of your admin tasks using some kind of automation. You know, anything that you can do in your mind, you know, with control C, control V, you know, that kind of stuff, you can do, you can program your script to do it and go through. If you wanna go through everybody's shared home directory and active directory and you wanna take out one piece and replace it with another, you can do it and it's done. The scary part is you can do it and it's done because just like SQL transact SQL scripting, you can take a database and in one click, and I had this at my first job, they had a big database full of all kinds of clients and customers. And the developer came to me and said, well, we need to restore the database from a backup because in one click, she turned everybody into an Hispanic female. <laughs> okay, so we lost all the demographic information. We got to restore the backup. So that's what's nice about the what if, is you can test it. So you always have to be careful what you're typing because in a heartbeat, even the GUI can do this, but in a heartbeat, things can be gone and done. And it doesn't take very long to go through 5,000 users. Just no. not that I've done that for many years. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I, I, no, I haven't deleted them, but I definitely did kind of this Hispanic thing. Yes. Well, then that's when you go back to your backup tape and discover there's a bug in the backup software and you can't restore the database. Okay. So PowerShell first came out back in the days of like Windows XP, back in the days of Windows 2008. It came out as being, it, it was part of the operating system when you installed it. And that was back in like version one and version two. And let me tell you something, because this just happened yesterday or the day before. Version of the PowerShell that you're running makes a big difference. Because the admin next to me was trying to do something to get some information and it wasn't working right. I was like, okay, well that command should be right. Check the version of your PowerShell. He came back, he was running version two. He was logged into a server with version two. So one of the things, and, and Kind of this little handout here, it works a lot better if you get the electronic version, so we'll have to get it posted, um, just because I'm sure you don't want to manually type these links that I put in here, but if you need additional information, you can click the link and, and get to these sites, and, and that'll help you. Some of this is just copy and pasted from them, but you log into a machine and you open up power, oh, and I should bring this up too. Um, one thing my boss likes to say, there's more than one way to skin cat. Okay, so a lot of it is kind of finesse. I grew up in the days of basic, visual basic, that kind of thing. I've done programming along those lines. Yes, I'm, I'm right with you, Ryan, and spell it all out. I like to make it all nice and neat. Some people like to try and cram everything into one line and then you can't read it. But how you do something, he, he'll do something one way, I'll do something different. You'll come up with a totally different way as well, as long as you get to the same endpoint, right? Some people like to use the ISE, the Integrated Scripting Environment. Okay, I don't. I've grown up using the command prompt, so to speak, the PowerShell command prompt, just like the, the DOS command prompt. Now, you can use, that. that is nice. 
although I use Notepad++ is another one that I use, and it will also color code your code, and, act, and I go in and turn it off, but it'll also give you the little prompting helps with the little pop-ups, I can't stand that. Don't be popping up at me while I'm typing. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, so yeah, there are other options, and people at work like to use the ISE. It does look nice, it's kind of a nice environment, but uh, this is just kind of the way that I've always done it. So I tend to do it from here. Now from here, you can run your other commands like you would do uh, from your DOS prompt and things like that. It'll come up just like you're at a, at a regular command prompt. But if you need to find out, it, it doesn't show you anything. It just says Windows PowerShell. Now we're running on Windows 10. But one thing you can type, this is a variable. And we haven't talked a lot about variables yet. Okay, I'm not gonna bother to point with my mouse because it's too much of a delay, but the dollar sign at the beginning is kind of backwards from the old Visual Basic type days. You always put the dollar sign at the end. But in PowerShell, the dollar sign goes in the beginning and that designates it's a variable. Now there are some variables that are kind of hard coded into the system. This is one of them. And if you hit enter, it'll come back and it'll report on the different versions. So right now, this is the, the current version of PowerShell is the 5.1. That's the last version that Microsoft has released. Um, this kind of is humorous as well, I think. Um, in coming up with these notes, lo and behold, Microsoft has now given up the development of PowerShell. This is the last version of PowerShell that Microsoft will produce. There is a new one called PowerShell Core that is an open source and it's currently available as like 6.0 or something like that. Now it's open source. So it's kind of out of Microsoft's hands, although Microsoft still tries to be involved in the development. One of the big differences is these versions of PowerShell, version 5.1 and earlier are part of Microsoft and are very integrated into the .NET. So you have a lot of capabilities with the commands in getting into the, into the nitty gritty of, of the various systems that you're working on. With PowerShell Core 6, it's in the .NET Lite. And so now you don't have as much access into that. And the reason why is because they've expanded it out to include like the Mac, the Mac environments, uh, Linux environments, even Android environments. So, the idea behind that is you'll be able to write a piece of code and then you'll be able to run it on multiple different systems. We're all Windows admin, so we're usually gonna be stuck in Windows anyway, because nothing I'm gonna write is gonna work on a Linux box for the most part. Um, so that's one thing to keep in mind. This is gonna be it from Microsoft. This is gonna be the last version. You can run both versions side by side. I haven't done it yet. I haven't had the opportunity to turn, start learning this new core version and see how it works. It's supposed to function basically the same. So like I said, your version is extremely important because if you're, if you're running a really old version, a lot of your commandlets are gonna be missing parameters and things like that, and they're not gonna run as expected, okay? Another way that you can get the same information is with the get host command. And I see this a lot. And the reason why I see this a lot is because in PowerCLI, there's a get VM host. And so I usually forget the VM part and just type get host and then it's like, that's not what I wanted. Um, but it'll give you the same information. Now, one thing to keep in mind with PowerShell that thankfully is different from Linux is I can type and get the same information without the caps. <laughs> And I can do the same thing with the PS version table and get it without the caps. So it's not case sensitive. So it is not case sensitive, correct. Now, another preference thing, you'll see me back up and capitalize things because I like the case, because it helps me. That's one thing new that came out in the version five of the PowerShell 2 in the editor. You don't see it so much on this screen, but they added color kind of like what you would get in the ISC 
in the editing part so that it distinguishes variables and distinguishes commands so it's a little easier to read as you're typing. But no, it is not case sensitive. Now, originally PowerShell came out, was a Microsoft thing for, for a Windows environment. Okay, now everybody else kind of jumped on the bandwagon with this because this is what Microsoft was going as the automation tool for admins. So, first of all, you get the basic version of PowerShell on your machine. And you can do your basic Windows commands. You can list out your commands and you'll get X number of commands. Now, suppose you're a directory services administrator, uh, Active Directory. There's an Active Directory module, which doesn't show up on this machine because it's not logged into a domain, but on a domain controller or a domain member, then you can get the Active Directory module. And then that gives you another Y number of commands that you can use for administrating Active Directory. Still within the Microsoft realm. You can go beyond that. You can get one with the Active Directory, then you get the things like groups, you get group policies, you get users, you get all these as objects. Then you get beyond that, you can get into other things like you can get into the event log and managing that on remote servers. You're not limited to just yourself. I mean, what good would an Active Directory ability be if you had to do it on the local machine? Okay, so one nice thing about PowerShell is they've added the ability to work against remote machines. Now there's two ways that you could do that. Some commands have that built in. You know, am I gonna run, what am I gonna run this against? Which server am I gonna run this against if I wanna get an Active Directory user? Other commands run locally, but you can execute them remotely. PowerShell allows you to do both. With that, you have to have that Windows remote management service enabled on your machines, servers and whatnot to be able to count. You can do w, WMI, you can do SIM sessions, but you have to have the ability to, to remotely talk to your servers. So with that comes considerations with firewalls, if you're going multi-site um, through the internet and things like that, VPNs, you've got to have the ability to reach through on those ports. So that's one thing that you'll run, and even WMI has its own built-in security features and things like that that block you that you have to get around to enable remote accessing servers. Most annoying thing in the world is have a nice script to go through and you know, copy all the files on all the servers from the temp directory to the shared directory and find out it's turned off you know, on this server or that server, and then boom, you're going through. So we're still in the world of Microsoft. Out comes Exchange, out comes SQL Server, out comes SCCM, out comes SharePoint. Now they all have their own modules, okay, that you can import into your environment. You're not an SCCM manager, so you don't need it, so it's not installed on your machine, right? But he might need it but then you might need the exchange. As a matter of fact, the newer versions of exchange, they're, they're geared more towards doing your administration from PowerShell instead of the GUI. They're trying to get away from the GUI. Why? Because the mouse is slow. Not to mention, this is geared more towards breaking multiple accounts at once instead of just one at a time using the GUI, right? Um, I like how you phrase that, too. Yes. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> You have no idea. One slip of a character, and they all don't work. I've watched it in that same NAS migration. It's like, okay, these users can't get to their shared directory. I spelled that wrong. Okay, it's fixed. They should all be good now. I don't know what that problem was. Yes. <laughs> it looks like it's fine on my end. I don't know. Travel. Restart it. Yeah. Restart it again. You guys always blame the network. It was a replication <laughs> problem. Yeah. So now you can start adding in modules, other Microsoft modules for managing other environments. Then on top of that, now you get out into the third party world, which is where we are here with VMware. And that's where they came out with the Power CLI. I've heard some people call it Power CLI. That's <laughs> annoying. Um, Power CLI, those are the VMware command lines that work within v or, yeah, v Center, which work within PowerShell. And you can use the Power CLI to manage a VM, a bunch of VMs. You can use it to manage a host, an ESX or ESXi host. You can use it to manage vCenter. 
And then from within that, you can manage multiple vCenters, multiple hosts, data centers, folders, clusters, VMs, data stores, data store groups, whatever. And you can manage, and you can just wipe out an entire environment right from your keyboard. Uh, so that's kind of the mindset. It's sort of like Legos. You just kind of keep adding in the little modules for whatever you need to work on. Again, the PowerShell version is important because Power CLI may not like or may not run on PowerShell 2.0. So keep that in mind. Okay, so going through on the notes, we've talked about ver versions a little bit, um, talked about PowerShell core, uh, installing and upgrading PowerShell. So you've got your Windows Server 2008 R2 box and it's got PowerShell 2. Can you put a newer version of PowerShell on it? Yes. And what that comes is it's not a PowerShell download, it's Windows Management Framework, which actually includes the Windows Remote Management. Yes, it requires a reboot. So plan it accordingly, whatever you're gonna install it on, your desktop you don't care, but servers you do. Okay, so you can install up to, and this little chart here kind of gives you an example of what you can get, what's compatible with what, what came with what, and Windows Management Framework like 5.1 is the latest, latest one that you can get and install and get your PowerShell on a server, or get your PowerShell on your box to a newer version. I'm gonna break in just to tell the story. So when I was learning PowerShell, I, I didn't understand that there were the versions of what came on that. I, I slowly figured it out. So then I started on my machine, I always had the latest version on because we have Windows 7 running on that. And one day I got on a user's box and was trying to do something and it had PowerShell 3. And I was like, oh, this sucks. So I'm also the guy that creates the images for all our, our Windows 7 images. All our Windows 7 images now go out with version 5.1 on them just because, you know what, I'm not getting on that machine ever again and having to do that. I just build it into my image from now on. It just makes life so much easier. But yep. it, it really stinks when you try to go on something and try to run a command that you know is there in 5.1 and it's not on 3. Just what? I hate Cisco switches, I always. I love Cisco switches, but yeah. Check your version first. The first thing you'll do is try to run a command and it just it won't be there or it will be removed. It's a weird yep. long version. Yeah, it's the entire run. Yeah, I know. <laughs> really? Yeah. Oh, you suck. <laughs> <laughs> it makes you feel any better. We still have some of bias. <laughs> okay, launching PowerShell. You should have, on most systems, you'll end up with four icons default to launch PowerShell, two of which are the ISE environment and two of which are just your basic command line environment. And they split it up because if you're running 64-bit machines, you can run in a 32-bit only environment or you can run the standard, which, is, which has the 64-bit set. Now, one thing I like to point out, because this makes a difference, especially in, in enterprise type environments, but just like the command prompt, you can run it as you. So if I run, just click on the button right here, and I type that right. Who am I? I've got the Ryan bug. It's this microphone. No, it's, it's that, and just when you're typing and yes. you're presenting, you can never, it just brain freeze. Okay, so you're running as whoever your logged in user is. Now, if you're just at home, maybe this doesn't matter, but you can also run as administrator, which still appears as me, but notice at the top, that's administrator, this is the, that new UAC type bypass, this gets you into something, a lot of commands require administrator elevated privileges to run. Okay, even installing modules in PowerShell, which we'll get to getting out there, you have to do that from the administrator prompt. It's like some software you have to run as an administrator. You have to install software as an administrator. Are you able to elevate yourself to the command line? There are some scripts that you can run that do it, but it's not easy. It's much easier just to go ahead and, okay, yeah. 
you can launch them that way, just like you can do any other icon that you would put on your desktop. You can right click and have it launch as administrator. So when you click on it by default, it launches as administrator. Now in, in any other environment, uh, if you right click, it may not work on here. Up the menu, then right click the Windows PowerShell within that menu. Okay, there it is. Run as different user. Now, most enterprise environments have gone to the best practice. Your standard user account that you're logged in on your desktop is just that, it's just a standard user. If you want to do any elevated privileges, you have your own domain admin, whatever account that you log in with. Okay, this will bite you too, because if you're sitting on your workstation and you're trying to run scripts against Active Directory, you can read everything you wanna read, but when you go to set, you can't change it because you're not logged in as your elevated user. This, you can launch it just like you can do any other icon on your desktop that you have, you can launch as a different user. So now you have that window open as your user. You can also, when you run scripts, a lot of these will give you the option to add credentials. So you can run it as your standard user and provide it credentials to run that command as an elevated account if you want to do that. Or prompt the user for credentials to enter when they run it. So that's also important to, to remember when you're running it. Um, we talked about modules and, and snapshots and things, or snap-ins used to be called snap-ins, but let me get out of this one here. Right now, these are the modules that are loaded in, in this instance of PowerShell. PowerShell standard PS read line for your information is the one that gets added as, as part of PowerShell 5, which gives you the nice little color coded when you type your commands and things like that, you can actually export that and import that into another server machine that does not have that for whatever reason. Um, I've done that because once you get the colors, then you don't like them to not be there anymore. Um, so if I want to, and I'll just use this one as an example. <clears throat> that, that's the, the VMware Power CLI module. And it's going to take a minute because it's going to load a bunch of extra commands and it'll pop up if you've ever run Power CLI. When you launch it from the icon that VMware provides when, when they install it, uh, you get this little pop up menu, which will, there it is. And now if I do the get module, see now I have all of these, which gives me access to. the BI server command. Now, if I were to, um, okay, that doesn't work. Why? Because I don't have the SCCM module loaded. So then you get that message. But the fact that connect VI server works, okay, the VMware modules, and you can just looking at the list of different modules, you can get in the horizon view, the licensing, your NSX, um, cloud, uh, site recovery manager is all part of that storage uh, is a big thing. Uh, it's not just your, your VM and your host, but you can also manage your underlying storage. Uh, this, this script here, which is an old version, is an example of one that I run against an environment and pulls all the information of all the VMs and get all the details. So, and we'll get into a little bit more of what you can get from anything in PowerShell and kind of the reasoning behind it. But, and as you can see, uh, you know, how you write things, you can spell it all out. You've got your little curly brackets and all that other kind of stuff. You can cram them all up into one line, but some of us just like to spread it all out and put in your comments and be able to read it or have somebody else come along later and read it, okay? And, I included some links on there, so feel free to click with your finger. Um, 
on any of those and you can get little websites here that give you quick commands and uh, reference guides and things like that for uh, which this poster, I used to have a, an older version of that poster and I've lost it a long time ago. So it's nice to get another one, but um, where to go to find your PowerShell information. Or you can use the ISE and have it just keep popping things up in front of your face while you're trying to type. Now, one of the things that's important to understand in, in PowerShell, when we did a little bit, let's go back here to um, our PS version table. Now, notice it gives a name and a value, and there's actually a bunch of different items that are in there. There's PowerShell version, PowerShell edition, there's compatible versions, there's build versions, there's CLR, there's uh, Windows management, um, remoting, and all this other kind of stuff that's in there in just one variable. Now, back in the old, old basic days, you think of a variable just like algebra. How many of you are like really big into the mathematics and sciences? That's my thing. The Englishes and, and history, that's not my thing. Okay, so the math kind of stuff, that's, okay, I can get to that. With, so algebra, you've got your, your variable X. It can be any number, right? You don't know. And that's part of solving for X when you do your mathematics. Well, in PowerShell, you have variables, the same thing. They can hold a number. They can also hold more than a number. They can hold text. So you can have that same, we'll just use X. So we'll just say X equals three. Okay, it didn't say anything, right? Now, if I just type a variable like that, kind of like I did with the PS version table, it'll display what the value is. There's another way that you can do it. You can do write host. So kind of shorthand versus longhand, you'll see me do that. I'll just type it and you'll see. So what is X? X, X is three. I can also say X equals, so now I type X, now it's text, it's hello, right? Now, one of the things that you'll remember from the old ba Visual Basic and, and C Sharp and all those others is defining your variable. Now you can define your variables and in some cases you need to do that so that PowerShell knows what kind of information is being stored in that variable. But for the most part, you don't have to define your variable ahead of time. Now you can also go in and change things. There's also the global setting you know, from one function and one subroutine to another, whether that variable carries along with it or not. Uh, generally, I don't ever run into that. I just say X is equal to hello, X is now hello. Now, if I type in, so it types hello, hello, twice. I didn't have to type in equals. I just said, show me what it is. So we're going to get into some of the different operators and then we're going to get into some of the different, um, yeah, like your different loops and things like that, which Ryan showed us a little bit. So we've got our X, but now if I do this, so I run the get process command and it returns just like if I were running, running the task manager on Windows, right? A lot of information. Well, okay, you can kind of, you can play around with paging it and stuff like that, but wow, there's a lot there. What if I do this? What am I gonna get? Nothing. It's kind of like when you go to Menards and you buy a bunch of wood, you get a piece of paper and you just paid $3,000 for the piece of paper. What'd you get? Nothing, okay? <clears throat> but if I type this, there's all that same information. That is stored in that variable. Now, it's more than just a variable with this big wad of information in there. If I add this to it, there's 197 elements in that variable. The variable basically becomes an array of objects. Now, I can also reference if I want to know what the third one is, 
You following me here? I want to know what the third element is, so I put a two in the brackets, right? Why? Because it starts counting at zero. So this is the third element right here, and it's this Adobe CEF helper, okay? Now, if I take his... You're showing me a flyer of your code of results. Is the variable result of the function when you first ran it, or what, what's the statistic? It's static. It is static. So you gotta remember to refresh unless it automatically refreshes and whatever that you're doing. If you're, if you're manipulating that variable, then it gets, but yeah, any one of these tasks disappear, they still show up in that variable. That was that one snapshot in time that it just grabbed that. So if I look at this variable and there's a whole bunch of information in here and I did, I piped it. Okay. And, and that's one of the most important things, one of the top, things to remember about PowerShell is that piping command, okay? And basically, you can, you can stack them up. You can keep going one after another, and basically what you're doing is you're taking the output of this command and sending it into the next one. Now, if, if the output from this one can't be processed by the next command, you're gonna get an, get an error. So basically what I'm doing is I'm taking that variable X and I'm piping it into the get member. Now I could, and I'll probably get this wrong. Yeah. So what do we do? Okay. So either way, I'm taking the X variable and I'm listing the different members that you could get. Now, I don't know why this list is shorter than this list up here. Yeah. Um, so if, if you look at, these are the things that are available to each element that's in this array. Remember, there's 197 elements that are in this array. In each one of those elements, there's a list of alias properties, there's a list of events, there's a list of methods, note properties, properties, property sets, and I don't even know what script properties is actually kind of a, like a calculated field. Um, but properties is kind of your static value. And if we take your house, a property of your house would be the color. So if I ask what the color was of your house, it's gonna come back as blue. Now, if I go back up and I look at a method, what's a method? Method is something that you can do. So in the case of your house, we can paint your house. So that would be a method against your house would be to paint it. And when we paint it, then we're changing the property. So in this particular case, remember, we're looking at processes that are running on this machine. Some of these methods you can close you can dispose, you can kill. These are your same, you can start, refresh. These are the same kind of things that you can run from the task manager, right? That actually changes something that's running on that process. So if we go back to that process, we look the third element that's in there, we could actually kill it. Properties, just tell you something that's going on in each one. Now notice, look at all this information that you have in there, but if I just do go back to our it's only showing us so many of them, even though there's a whole bunch of stuff. So let's, we're gonna jump ahead a little bit to a formatting. So if I take, we're gonna take the output from that second element and I'll, I'll type it out, format list. Now, instead of doing it like a table, now it's doing it a long format. Now there's a shorthand for that. We can do the same thing and we can just type FL. That's your alias. So we're just formatted as a list. If you're writing a, a script or something, write it out as <coughs> format list. If you're just doing it on your keyboard, do it as fast as you can. But it's still not showing me everything that's in there. I, 
that we want to see. <coughs> so we can get that. If I, if I want to see it all, then just use the asterisks. Then question marks work too, but question marks, just like everything else, wildcard is just a single character. So you can use the asterisks. So the information is there, but that there's just kind of this default smaller amount, this kind of what people normally want to see, kind of when you open Task Manager, you just see these five columns. But if you want to see it all, and you want to see all these other things that generally in Task Manager we would go in and add in as columns, all that information is stored in there. And remember, we're still in there in just one variable, X, okay? Variable names can be anything you want. Or you can do Just remember, whatever you call it, you're going to have to type it. Uh, um, they are case insensitive. Insensitive. They're not case sensitive, which means they're insensitive. <laughs> okay. Yes. Let me show you another. Um, seems how we put those in there. One other thing, this PowerShell drive. If you look at this list, you can see there's aliases in here. There's your C drive, D drive that's actually on the physical machine. Certificates are in there, environment variables, functions, registry. You can manipulate the registry like you would your C drive and move around in there. Variables. All right, did I type something wrong? I'm trying to go to that. Okay. Here's all the variables. And look, there's my all my favorite processes, all my processes uh, down here, the X. I can manipulate, I can navigate around in here if I go back. So I'm in, I can do a DIR of the registry just like I would a regular disk. Add it like it's a colon. So you do your CD change directory, variable with a colon. Now I can tell you, for you, those of you that have SCCM, if you load the SCCM modules, it'll take your site and it'll add it as a drive. So you can navigate your site just like, it, like a, another drive. Once again, you're in there messing around in the registry, you can delete keys and create keys. You know, everybody comes to me and says, well, my C drive is full. Well, there's a file in the system 32, it's called kernel.dll, delete that. That's a lot of wasted space. Um, <laughs> so <clears throat> it's nice, it's convenient because you can write one script that goes into your C drive and moves your files to another drive and you can go in and read registry keys or check if registry keys are there, delete registry keys, change them or whatever. So now you're starting to get kind of the idea of the power behind and the danger behind PowerShell. So we can do the same thing and see if this works. Yeah. 
Yes, one of these days, we'll talk about this. <laughs> Literally yesterday when I got home from work, I had vCenter running. But there's, a, there's an automation, I don't know which, a, a lab environment called Autolab, if you search for Autolab VMware. And he wrote this and you just download this file and you can get it for workstation or you can get it for fusion or you can get it for cloud. I don't remember what their cloud provider is. But basically I downloaded the workstation version and it has all these VMs set up as a shell, as shell VMs. And then, so the first thing you set up is your, your router because this is in its own network. Auto lab. Thank you. And then you set up, there's free NAS. So now you have your share drive. And then what they, what they have you do is, here's the share drive and it's got all the directories set up and he just gives you a list. You need to populate it with, I think I can show you. Yes. Yeah. We'll, we'll get to all that kind of stuff too. Um, so you can, all you have to do is put your installer ISOs or installer EXEs or expanded in, and then you go into each of the VMs, like the domain controller, and you just attach your Windows Server 2012 eval to it, turn it on. He's already got the unattended XML in there, set it up. It creates Windows Server and then he runs another build script underneath that that promotes it to a domain controller and creates all the lab environment and all this other whatever stuff. So you turn it on and then you come back tomorrow, <laughs> depending upon how fast your machine is, and you've got a domain controller. And then after that, you can create your host. So there's three ESXi hosts. Pick which versions you want. You want version. 5, 5.1, 5.5, 6.0, boom. Now you got three hosts. Then you create the vCenter. I struggled with that one um, only because when I extracted out of my ISO files, I had short file names instead of the long file names, so all the installers were failing. But as of yesterday, I have a working vCenter, which had auto added my hosts to it, created the data center, and it even created two VMs. This is all running on a laptop with 16 gig of RAM. At the moment, <laughs> it's slow. The more you turn on, the slower it gets. So you don't do a lot, but I mean, you can do horizon view and all this other kind of stuff. So it was something tried to put together so that we would have like a VMware environment to, to connect power CLI to and test with. So right now I'm in, I'm on my domain controller. So I have, I have the active directory module loaded. Now, one of the things when PowerShell knows about the modules and there are, what is that? I just did this. Okay, I added this ENV, that's shorthand for the environment variables and then PS module path. So it, if I just did a set, I have a, a environment variable on this machine that's PS module path, that's PowerShell module path, sort of like your standard path statement in your environment. This is where PowerShell looks to find modules. So if you tell it load active directory, it's gonna search through all of these to find that module file. So if you download a module somewhere, you can put it in one of these paths. Some of them are global to the environment. Some of them are user specific, but that's where PowerShell looks to load it. Once PowerShell knows about it, all I have to do is type get ad user. It knows, oh, that's one of the active directories. If it's not already loaded, it'll go load it. It's not 100%. Some things are kind of flaky about that, but um, at least with Microsoft, Microsoft likes Microsoft. so. I can shorthand and just type get ad user and pull it up. Now, if I just, if I take my variable and type, I 
Now count is a property. And that's telling how many elements are in, there are 13 users in Active Directory. So if I go back to that, that these are all the properties that I have available. And one thing that Ryan brought up, now let's go back up and add another. So by default, it only pulls a handful of the properties out of Active Directory. Now, if I do the same thing, now I have a whole bunch of Active Directory. This is one I use at work all the time as my regular user because I don't need to, well, actually I don't have rights to change anything because I'm not an Active Directory admin, but it is so much easier for me to just always have my PowerShell window open and I need to look for a user and find out, oh, let's see. Um, let's see, uh, admin, uh, let's see, city, uh, let's see, what else is in here? I know the one, um, oh, yeah, it escapes me, but like if you're locked out, is that in here? Locked out, false. So, it's a lot faster for me to just get AD user and then hit the username if there it is. Multiple domains in your environment, there's a command in there that says pick the server. So you're gonna to talk to this domain or that domain, all from the same window. Now, granted, I have it launched as my elevated user or as long as you have a user that has read writes, but that is all in there. So now I can go back and type in that same user, that's one piece that's in there. Now the flip side of that, that's reading the information. Now what if I turn around and wanna set the user information? Now you're getting into more dangerous territory. You know, once again, are you logged in as a read-only user or are you logged into somebody that can change stuff? But you can go in, we'll do our get help. I don't wanna wait an hour. <clears throat> so you can actually go in and you can feed. So if I take that same user, just that one element, the third element that's in that, right? And I'm, I'm assuming that I know what that is. I mean, this is just kind of picking an arbitrary one. But I'm feeding that into, and I can change anything Whoa, that's frightening, isn't it? Now, if I do, what's that user's name anyway? I changed it that fast. Now, <clears throat> we know what we want to do. So we'll use his little, so we'll take X. And we know that has 13 elements in it. And I know that I want to find the user VI admin. So I type that in there. Now you can, the longhand way is where object. But you don't have to do where object, you can just do where and they're in curly brackets. Now, I am looking for the user whose name is VI admin. Out of those 13 entries that are in that variable, show me the one whose name is VI admin. Now I know that the property name is called name, right? So when you pipe from one to another, there's a little shorthand. dollar sign underscore. So what that's doing is taking every element that's in that array 
and I'm looking specifically for the name property. Now this is where you get into some of these little operators and things that are in the list. Um, I'm not saying what I reference, but I forget sometimes. I do reference this. That's what I reference on computer. Yeah. <laughs> this, this is the one that trips me up every time because this is so foreign to basic and things like that. What you would want to do is type this. Yeah. Show me the one where name equals. It can't read that. So if I go back, because it's not equals, if I do dash, there's my VI admin. So now I take that, I know I'm going to get just that one record. So I've taken all 13 records and I've passed them into this and say, show me just the ones that say VI admin as the name and then just show me the name and locked out. Now, let's suppose I don't really know what his name is. I know it's a it's a V something. There he is. If there were more than one, it would show more than one. So when you make changes to that variable, is it just changing the variable or is it submitting it back to the it's just changing that snapshot that you have in the variable. No, because if I, yeah, you have to use the set command to write the changes back in Active Directory. So kind of getting an idea of. Well, yeah, if you use the set command, what I, I'm, I'm, let's, let's kind of unpack what you're thinking. I think I know where you're going. When you said that earlier, I thought you meant you wrote it back to, or you changed something in Active Directory, and I'm like, does the rest of the variable update do that? Well, because, <laughs> now, so it, it goes into the piping and, and, and fills that out. So what he did was he used X as all of those list of names, and he piped that into the set command. So he's taking those variables and piping it into set. So he actually did update Active Directory by doing that. But what, by what, by using that X, he just saved typing, get AD user and all that stuff. I know. He's still taking that list of users and well, setting them. I would think of like Python bash changes and stuff for a lot of times. Yeah. yeah. So at yeah, that this... point, it's not that you're not changing those objects, but you're using that name of that object to feed into typing that into the set command. So at that point, you are actually changing the active directory. No, oh, it's actually looking for Yeah. That's why it works because I give it an object to yeah. feed and make changes to It's not like the S I don't know. But yeah. Again, what's in X is just a snapshot. You can do whatever you want to to X, you can delete X, it's, it's not deleting those records. That's why you have a get and you have a set, is if you wanna change the information that's out there, that's where you generally use the set. The get just, you're always safe when you're using get, is you're just seeing what's out there. Now you wanted to know a little bit, let's go back to Okay, so here's our X. We already did that once.
So now what do you suppose X is now? Yep. So yes, you can manipulate strings just like if we did I'm adding one to whatever it is. So now it's four. I can also do y equals and get the same thing. A little shorthand. Now go back to our little scripts here. So this is what we got right now. So we'll start at the third character and we'll count three. Now we just get what's in the middle. So just like you would do in basic, in basic, you would manipulate that. Now let's say I want to know um, where I can find two L's. So tell me, it's at position two. So if I go back, that will get really complicated. So I want to know just part of this. And if I do what am I going to get back? So I've nested them inside, just like you would do in calculus and things like that. I've nested them inside. I could do the same thing. If I knew the answer to that already, I can just say, just give me, starting in position two for two characters, there's my LL. But what I'm getting at is suppose I don't know what's in the string and I want to change that or I want to find that. Or what if I have... And I want to take out just the host name that's in there. So this will blow your mind. So we'll take, we know it's going to be the first character, right? It's the host name, it's the first part. I want to find the first period. Too many characters. Why? Because we count by zeros. Yeah. So if you want to feed it a list, a list of fully qualified domain names for servers, you can put this one line in there and get back your host name and get that out of your list of servers. Another example that I've used in the past and it's very similar thing is I have a list of email accounts and I need the usernames and it's not in the list. I'm substringing and getting out and taking that stuff off and just doing it at the at sign and pulling everything in front of that. Yeah. So you just, you just have to start playing with it and having use cases and then you run into it. And, and this is the other thing about PowerShell. Sometimes you'll get in a rabbit hole and you'll do something that will take you 10, 15, 20 minutes to do something and, and do it, you know, it'll only take you a couple minutes. But that time you're learning comes back and pays back as it goes. So force, you have to force yourself to start using PowerShell because then you start using it. And then you start like, like Tim, I just have a PowerShell window open. I have actually, I have multiple PowerShell windows open because I have stuff set up for different things that I do all the time. And mine may have, I have a PowerShell script running with a, with a while loop, not a where loop, but a while loop <laughs> going through the day and you just, you just have it running there and you, you just watch the output. Now, now let's suppose you, you feed it a list of your fully, fully qualified domain names, kind of like that NAS migration. Now look, now we have the ability to
we're going to replace that So just like that, if you're moving everybody's home directories from one server to the next, you can go through, you can feed it your list. I use that as an example, feeding it a list because you can import, you can import a CSV file or a list of text files and then iterate through each one of those or iterate through your entire list of Active Directory users and replace, and you take this and you feed it back into your set AD user and in one line, in just a matter of minutes, you can annihilate 500 users, can't get to their home drive. <laughs> As you mentioned, there's more than one way to skip the cat. My first PowerShell project, still looks back up, um, was replacing home folder. And I did get a user and then made the user distinguish name and variable and then had that up at the end of the UMC task and then ran that through all of my users. Fun fact, there are variables you cannot edit in, uh, in AD, um, particularly remote desktop uh, terminal, that's remote desktop terminal profile and home directories. The terminal services ones, I think you have to get the, um, the old Quest. Quest used to have an Active Directory module that would let you modify terminal service. But I think you can do it now. You might just have to, I, th I think there's some other things you have to manipulate to get into it from standard windows, but. Yeah. So. Right. Uh, user PS base invoke set, and then you have to invoke the set upon the specific name. Oh, yeah, I've played with that in the past. It's not fun. Yeah, it took me three days. Yep, but you know it now, so now you know where to go, go back and pull your code from. How yeah, will, how will it be much harder to use this list? Correct. Um, and you, you asked about elevating permissions. Um, and a lot of my scripts, I, I actually, the first thing, I have a little chunk that elevates it because I may or may not have help desktop that may not launch PowerShell and things are elevated permissions. So I'll automatically pick them up. Why do you think I knew exactly how to get to run as a different user? <laughs> I'll just look at this one here. Now, if I type this in, now it just took that same variable and then split it. So now, oh, I didn't, yeah. Now there are three elements in there, it split them. And I can turn around. I wonder why I used to do that. Is it with the brackets or not? I don't think so. You can put it back together, which a good example of using that is if you pull a VM or pull a server for IP addresses that has multiple IP addresses and you want to just make a column in your Excel spreadsheet with give me all the IP addresses, you can just slap them all together with commas instead of having to have 15 different columns or whatever. But there's examples that are in here on, you know, how to manipulate things like that with the numbers and the, the text and, and you can always search on, but it's quarter date. So this is probably a good place to stop.
So here's your homework for the next meeting. Yeah. <laughs> Just play with permission. Go back and find a reason to use a zero. Do something. I agree. I think it's a great screen. <laughs> If you also notice, Kevin and I are both running in test environments too. It's good to have a test environment. <laughs> Set up a test environment. It's very helpful. Don't be a turn. Make sure your inheritance is turned on or off. Or you have been so he has one here on the front page about PowerShell Gallery. One thing that I'll mention about getting scripts off the internet, even if it's in your gallery, read through what they're doing because they may not all be safe. Look out for those sets and removes in those scripts. I see lots of just kind of linear like parts. I what I and what I do sometimes is I read through their scripts, see what they're doing, and then do my own. Yep. Yeah. I'm just look, looking for a concept. That's why it's good. That's why I also then break up the full thing. I don't use aliases because when I start seeing scripts that have aliases in, I don't want to have to spend the time. I'll, I'll find some, someone else has got an example that doesn't use aliases. We did create a repository on our community page where you can upload scripts to share with each other. Just like the pure example. We haven't put very many on there, but I've done both. Jeremy has Texas. <laughs> And that's that's another gotcha. Now that they've gone to getting all of this stuff from the internet, and these new get repositories like PowerShell Get stuff like that, PowerShell Gallery, uh, that's great for your workstation as long as you're connected to the internet. But if you've got servers that are blocked from the internet, oh, you can't get that. And PowerCLI is one of them that has gone that route. The last version of PowerCLI that you can download is like six point five point three or. 5.1 or something like that. From that, that's an installer. From then on out, you have to get it from the PowerShell gallery, which you can do it on your workstation, and it's a pain. I think that's one of them that I posted on in there or gave examples <coughs> or something. But get it on your workstation, then you can export it, copy those <coughs> files to the server, and then import them on the server, and then you get. Yeah, um, you know, so we're going to have basically three like this, and then the, the September ones are these more like presentation, um, specifically from Kyle Reddy talking about PowerShell or Power CLI. Um, assuming we get these up, we'll be going to watch it before he has his presentation so we can kind of um, address kind of what we've learned, kind of have a baseline of what 